everybody, and welcome to the SIP Shelter in Place series on the STIR. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin. And as always, joining us for another episode of Movies, Movies, and More Movies, along with some fun stuff in between, is author and entertainment guru, Debbie Baldwin. Hey, Deb. Hey, Trish. Thanks for having me. Sure, of course. We are so happy to have you because how are we going to have a part two without a part one? I know, so, we do the girls. Yes, we are gonna get right to this. Uh, the show, as we mentioned, is actually part two of a binge-worthy movie list centering on buddy movies. Last week, we focused on the men. This week, we are shining the spotlight on the women. Deb, as you and I know, relationships among friends are as different as they come, and they really are reflected in, in a lot of these movies. You know, some are lifelong friendships, others are forged uh, at, in later years, and some of them even more of a frenemy dynamic. Definitely. Um, you know, there are fewer female buddy movies just across the board in film, and they don't do as well at the box office typically. Um, and, um, you know, the movie industry at the bottom of it all is an industry and they're in it to make money. So these films that have really done well at the box office and have really um, been successful uh, are a true testament to overcoming that sort of gender barrier in these films. And, you know, there's a great variety because, you know, women are complicated and so their friendships are complicated. And um, so while there are fewer films that really focus on female friendship, um, as opposed, I mean, in the sort of big box office sense of these really kind of adventure sure. charming films, um, the ones that, you know, are there and on the list are such a broad range compared to the men. It's, um, it's really interesting to look at. My goodness, it's a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> and the first movie we've got on the list is from 1988, Talk About All These Emotions. And we are, of course, talking about Beaches with Bette Midler and Barbara Hershey. And Beaches, I mean, let me just preface this by saying, okay, if you, if you haven't seen Beaches, you need to <laughs> get with the program here. Yes. Um, it's the sort of quintessential buddy movie um, drama. And I saw Beaches on an international flight. And I will tell you. Oh, no. Poor flight attendant. He had to sit on the arm of my seat and rub my back at first thinking it was a fear of flying issue, and then realized that I was watching Beaches. Deb, and, why did you do that to yourself? I mean, I <laughs> had to crawl off that airplane. It was, I mean, this movie is one of the most emotionally devastating, um, beautiful films about friendship that's ever been made, in my opinion. And Bette Midler plays this, you know, sort of very true to her own character, um, a successful Broadway star who struggled at first. And Barbara Hershey plays a quieter, more subdued attorney. Um, and they have their ups and downs over the years and their friendship endures. Barbara Hershey has a child and realizes that she has a grave illness um, when the, her daughter's very young. And it's just the story of the journey of this friendship that has been, you know, fraught with complication. It's just so real. And that their love for each other survives and endures and actually grows through all of these, the men in their lives and the different paths their lives have taken. It's just a beautiful, beautiful film. And of course, of course, the music. So, yes. You know. Yes, the music. And, you know, I'm still trying to get over that image of you in flight watching this movie because this is one of those movies where even at home, I send my husband out of the room when I'm watching it because it is so, I, I can't get over that fact that you saw it mid-flight. <laughs> and the, the guy next to me, like, 
tried to move seats. I mean, it was, I mean, I'm grabbing people. And <laughs> not a pretty cry at all. But um, yeah, it was a horrible place to watch that movie. I wish I'd been more. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, it's not really surprising to me that when this film came out, critics did not really like it. Uh, in fact, you know, I remember a review from Roger Ebert saying that um, it was predictable. It lacked the spontaneity of real life. But, you know, as we see with a lot of these films over the years, it really has garnered um, the acclaim that it deserved. And, you know, it's really become a lot more popular than it was when it first came out. Yeah, Gary Marshall directed it. And it's, um, if anything, it's reviews and opinions have gained traction over the years. It resonates with women, really with everyone. Um, I mean, to say it lacks authenticity is just madness to me. I mean, it's really one of the most authentic films in depicting a female friendship that I think I've ever seen. Well, beautifully look acting. who I quoted, Mr. Ebert, a man. Yeah. So yeah. what did he know? <laughs> well, and, you know? There's a lot of accusations in a lot of these movies of male bashing. Um, and, um, you know, that's, can, in some of these films we'll talk about, it is sort of a, an issue in the reviews. So, you know, who, it's obviously we're in a more politically correct world now, so. Exactly. Uh, and funny that you mentioned that because our next film is really going to get into it from 1991 when it came out. I mean, it was really critically acclaimed across the board. It's actually been described as a landmark of feminist film. And we are talking, of course, about Thelma and, and Louise. And um, yeah, Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon star in this very dark road trip buddy movie um, about two women who are going off to a cabin for a weekend getaway and things go awry from the very beginning and it turns into uh, fugitives running from the law. Um, I disagree that this movie uh, is a male bashing movie. I think there are good characters and bad. I mean, Harvey Keitel as mm -hmm. the policeman who's trying to talk some sense into the women and pursue a, you know, a more sensible resolution to what's been going on. Um, Brad Pitt famously makes his big motion picture debut in this film and immediately catches everyone's eye. What a debut it was. <laughs> right. Everyone you sort of knew from, you know, his, his little, his sort of brief turn as a, uh, I think he's a, a thief um, and becomes a lover of one of the women. And JD, yeah, was his, his character's and, name, uh, yes. Yeah, but and, uh, and Trish, you and I were talking about this before that I think of Thelma and Louise as sort of the female version of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It is these two women and while they're not intentionally criminals, it is that sort of same sense of two women heading towards, uh, you know, this spiraling doom um, that cannot be escaped. Yes. But that they embrace with the, you know, and it's just a very interesting exploration of human psyche as well as female psyche. And, um, you know, it's just a great movie because it's so original. And obviously the Academy agreed it won the academy award for best original screenplay um you'll never see another movie like it uh you know i can't think of one that even compares but it's definitely now an iconic film oh my goodness of course yeah and you know you mentioned it did win for the best screenplay which was so well deserved and it was nominated for a total of six academy awards um, Sarandon and Davis both nominated for Best Actress, but of course it was the year of Silence of the Lambs. And yeah. Silence of the Lambs won every single major award um, that year, except for Screenplay, of course, and of course Jodie Foster winning for the Best Actress uh, right. and award. I, and uh, it's, I think Silence of the Lambs must have won Best Adapted Screenplay. Yes, um, yes, yes, so, from, yeah, from the novel. Un, uh, Silence of the Lambs was unbeatable, so... And, <laughs> And also a strong, fabulous female lead character. So if the if Thelma, if Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis had to lose to someone, 
Jodie Foster's, you know, exactly choice. Yes. And so we were talking a little bit about Brad Pitt and his small but memorable turn as JD. You know, that casting for JD had some really intriguing history. And I don't know if you're aware of this, Deb, but Billy Baldwin was already hired for that role. Um, but he eventually dropped out because uh, pre-production for this film took uh, an exceptionally long time. George Clooney auditioned for the role five times, was rejected each time, five times. Um, Mark Ruffalo also auditioned and it eventually culminated in Robert Downey Jr. being hired to be JD in this movie. Um, but later on, the director Ridley Scott determined that uh, Robert Downey Jr. was too short for Gina Davis, who is six feet tall. And uh -huh. so eventually it was Gina Davis who ultimately picked uh, Brad Pitt for the role. So it, it's uh, <laughs> all those actors in this, uh, you know, amazing revolving I mean, door. You always, you always go back in my mind and try and imagine, you know, what if, you know, try and picture those actors in that role. But yes, you know, yes. Brad Pitt was an un relative unknown, but he really, <laughs> you know, made did an a impression on everybody. So, uh -huh. um, talking about the lead roles themselves, also an interesting pedigree of actresses um, that uh, was considered for Thelma and Louise. First of all, was Michelle Pfeiffer and Jodie Foster, who had both accepted the roles. Um, again, dropped out because pre-production, and then they ultimately um, picked up other work. Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn, who had been waiting to do a movie together, um, actually both were considering being in this movie, but instead they did the movie that we're gonna talk about next, and that was done the following year, 1992, and that is Death Becomes Her. Now, Death Becomes Her is not what you would consider a traditional buddy movie. And I did ask you, Deb, um, yes, why yes, is this I a buddy movie? <laughs> it in many ways is sort of the quintessential buddy movie. Um, Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn, and honestly, if you take a movie that has Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn in it, names above the title it's on the list like those are two women i could watch them do anything i mean they're just both incredible to watch um and together even better uh meryl streep in the film plays an aging actress who uh has stolen her mousier best friend's fiance and married him played by bruce willis Yes, and almost was, unrecognizable in the opening yes, scene. Did not even fabulous. realize it was Bruce Willis. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, so she goes to this very um, mystical consultant woman, a beauty uh, beauty specialist, and you know sells her soul to the devil for youth and gets this magical serum that makes her always look you know about it, like in her early thirties. And I'm the special effects in the film are really ahead of their time. They do an amazing job. Good enough to have won an Oscar for visual yes. effects, yeah. And you see why when you see the movie. And uh, uh, Meryl Streep, unbeknownst to her, Goldie Hawn has also taken the serum. So now she is quite the glamorous younger woman too. And Bruce Willis refuses uh, and ages himself. Um, again, it's a little bit of a commentary, too, on what Hollywood allows with male actors and what they don't with female actors. Um, it, in many ways, the film is sort of a modern day morality tale about life and embracing the things that matter to you and vanity and the, and the you know, the downfall that comes with vanity. Um, it is a really funny comedy about these two women trying to <laughs> keep their bodies from being damaged because even though they're eternally beautiful, they're still responsible for keeping themselves in one piece. But when they're fighting and knowing they can't kill the other one, the fights can get particularly vicious. Yes. So it's a flat out comedy um, with a nice message and some very talented acting behind it. Uh, I really liked this film. I know it got mixed reviews. I loved it and I would watch it again in a heartbeat. Um, I think it's a neat message and a 
really good story. And the two women do end up as m more than lifelong buddies, as eternal Yeah, buddies. best yeah. friends for life, beyond life, whatever. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I thought about it long and hard after I asked you, are you sure this belongs on this list? And, you know, when you think about near the end of the movie, when the two of them are together sitting on a church pew, and they're kind of bickering like old friends, you yeah. know, one um, worrying about the other's appearance and trying to figure out ways to fix the other's appearance. I mean, that's what you do for your friend. Right. Um, and so, yes, it, in that sense, of course, and they did not let the man come between them. They ended up, you know, friends again, together yeah. forever. Um, so, yes, and it was such a fun movie to watch. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we go to another film also released in 1992, a completely different genre, except for the comedy part. This has some comedy as well. But we're talking about A League of Their Own, which, you know, talk about an all-star cast. Uh, yeah. This is, this is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, Penny Marshall directs uh, A League of Their Own, which is about an all-female baseball league created during World War II when the men were all out fighting. And Tom Hanks plays the manager, uh, Gina Davis and Lori Petty play two sisters who come to be on the team. And then the cast is rounded out by Madonna and Rosie O'Donnell. Um, and the lesser known Cusack sister, Anne Cusack. Anne Cusack, yes. Joan and John's <laughs> sister. And did not, um, her career did not flourish the way John's and Joan's did. But um, she is, does a respectable job in this film and has appeared in some other things as well. But as a sort of core group of friends who, you know, learn life lessons and learn about the importance of men or lack of importance of men in their lives and the importance of, of you know, working together and supporting each other and learning the most important lesson you can possibly learn, there is no crying in baseball. There you go. One so, of the... American Film Institute's uh, top 100 movie quotes of all time. So you're right about that. You know, this story was inspired by a real life person named Dottie Collins, who is, of course, um, Gina Davis's Davis character. character. Mm -hmm. um, and she was described as known as the best player in the league for the actual team that they, um, you know, uh, have in the movie, which is the Rockford Peaches. Mm -hmm. And so to just maintain the authenticity of, of the baseball here, um, it was actually required for much of the cast who uh, belonged on the team to have baseball training. They had to know, first of all, how to play baseball, and second, had to undergo extensive baseball training um, during production. And Gina Davis joined the cast a little bit later um, but she really wowed them all. She mastered the game, you know, with half the time. So um, it's really a testament to, I mean, they put a lot of hard work into this game. And, you know, I'm seeing some um, interviews and some anecdotes talking about how a lot of those bruises and cuts that they had were actual bruises and cuts and that they actually, suffered during filming. Interesting. They show, you know, when they show at the end of the film, the slides of the actual team, um, in the cr when they're rolling the credits, and Gina Davis is a dead ringer, ah. the, the actual woman. I mean, I'm gonna have funny. to watch that again. Yeah. 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 So yeah, but that's a great wonderful. movie. And it's funny. Yeah, and you know, if there's a male counterpart to this, as we've you know said that for a couple of the movies there is, um, it would be Bull Durham for sure, which yeah. um, is that the sort of you know same kind of bonding camaraderie ensemble cast. Uh, great comedy, uh, but A League of Their Own is a standout uh, for, for, you know, in general. Yeah. But with a predominantly female cast, it it's, it's definitely goes on the list. I'd really be interested in seeing, you know, I, I didn't look it up for Bull Durham, about, you know, just pitch for pitch, catch for catch, how the men measured up against the women in terms of really performing their own stunts or their own plays on the field. <laughs> Maybe we should have them play. Like, wouldn't, yeah. you, wouldn't you pay to see that game for charity? Oh my gosh! Hello, Jim yeah. Adam, Susan Strandon on. Wow, one it'd be very. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Durham Bulls against the Rockford Peaches. That would be a great game. That would be a really great game. They should do it virtually or something. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, definitely a great movie. Definitely belongs on this list.
So our next movie comes in uh, from 1995, and it is Boys on the Side with Drew Barrymore, Whoopi Goldberg, Mary Louise Parker. Deb, I am ashamed to say that I saw this movie in the theater, but it was after dinner with friends, and so I had like a couple drinks, and I was sleepy. And so I maybe only saw bits and pieces of the movie, enough to know that some stuff happens in a car. You know, yeah. really, I really um, regretted not paying enough attention in the theater. It's a road trip movie. It is. It falls somewhere in between, you know, Thelma and Louise. And, um, you know, I'm trying to think of another, like, the sweetest thing, like a wild yeah. road trip movie and a very serious road trip movie. It's got a little bit of both. Whoopi Goldberg and Mary Louise Parker start off on the journey. They're going from the East Coast to California. They stop in Baltimore to visit Mary Louise Parker's friend, played by Drew Barrymore, who's in an abusive relationship. They fight off the boyfriend. Uh, time to a chair and leave. So now it's the three of them on the road. Right. Now, unbeknownst to them for a while, the boyfriend in trying to escape his bonds falls and hits his head and dies. So now we've got this very similar to the Thelma Louise situation. Right. A, so, sort of a fugitive scenario. Now, um, now, Matthew McConaughey makes an appearance in this film. He is the main male character. Um, but again, in the shadow of these three women, Mary Louise Parker is HIV positive. Whoopi Goldberg is a musician um, who is gay. Drew Barrymore is the kind of lost, um, you know, just escaping this domestic abuse situation. And it's the story of Mary Louise Parker and Whoopi Goldberg forming this unlikely relationship. Uh, again, a lot of ups and downs. Drew Barrymore has a romantic relationship with Matthew McConaughey's character, whose name is Abe Lincoln. And, <laughs> he plays a and they think they're in Arizona. They haven't made it all the way to California yet. And, but when he learns of the situation, he, you know, is torn between his law enforcement duties and his romantic duties. And so there's that whole situation to resolve. It's a very interesting film. It's very complex. I'm, I'm trying to, um, I, I, I'm sure it got mixed reviews. I don't think it did well at the box office. Um, but as far as like female dynamics and buddy films go, it's a very interesting movie. It's, um, they're, the three women are, I mean, could you ever imagine sitting down in a production meeting and casting Mary Louise Parker, uh, Drew Barrymore, and Whoopi Goldberg in a three-woman road trip drama. Yeah, it's, just the I dynamics know, of likely those women actresses. Together. <laughs> but um, strangely, it works in this, and it has this kind of um, wonderful resolution at the end. It's uh, sad, but also it's bittersweet. It's you know, there's a, it's a very nice storyline. It's not a movie I would, I don't even know how I ended up seeing it. It was not a movie it would have like looked at and said, oh, I'm going to see that for right. sure. You yes. know, it's a little like, hmm, I don't, there's a lot of weird stuff going on and. Right, exactly. A lot of very complex issues in a fairly lighthearted way. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a well acted, very interesting film about the female dynamic. Well, it most definitely worked because I have noticed that this film has a certain enduring quality to it. If you do some research, you know, about how this film is kind of um, perceived in this day and age, it, it tops a lot of, of lists in terms of, like you said, buddy movie and just a good solid movie. And, you know, I, I've mentioned this in the past, I'm a sucker for a good movie soundtrack. And this soundtrack yeah. for this movie is really remarkable for featuring an all-female lineup of artists. Yeah. We're talking and about so Bonnie Raitt, yeah, Cheryl yeah. Crow, Melissa Etheridge, uh, Annie Lennox. Arm and creating. I yeah. mean, it's on and on. Every song on that soundtrack is fantastic. I mean, if you don't want to see the movie, listen to the soundtrack. Listen to the soundtrack. The soundtrack. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. All right. So we are now on to another uh, film released the same year, 1995. This one I saw, this one I completely, completely enjoyed. 
and that is Clueless with Alicia Silverstone as Cher Horowitz. Yes, <laughs> and you don't think of this movie as a buddy movie, like right off the top of your head, um, loosely based on Jane Austen's Emma. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. didn't know. Um, Stacey Dash, who people will know from um, some other films. I can't, I don't know if she was a Disney star, but um, she is, she plays Cher's best friend Dion, and so they bond because they're both named after <laughs> famous singers from the 70s. Right. Um, and their project, their makeover girl, Ty, uh, played by Brittany Murphy, who, who passed away tragically. Um, and this was her, you know, kind of breakout role. Sure. Um, but this film uh, is a 10 out of 10 for me. It hits every note. The writing Amy Heckerling's script is fantastic. I coined the phrase as if. In as this if. <laughs> uh, and it's just this great story of this girl who's perceived as very vapid and clothes obsessed and vain who actually has a lot of depth to her and her uh, enemies to lovers, or I don't know what you call it, but her relationship with her stepbrother, Josh, who's played perfectly by <laughs> Paul Rudd. Yeah, yeah. Who's the sort of, you know, liberal college, you know, guy who's come home from vacation and is crashing on his stepfather's couch. And it's just a smart, well-acted story that, perfectly walks that line between um, great physical comedy and real like heartfelt good acting because you can't have those comic lines fall flat if there's mm -hmm. no depth to the characters delivering this. Good point. And yeah. so, you know, this movie is just, it hits it out of the park on that level. It's a great, great film. Oh, yeah. And, you know, as you said, hit all the right notes. This really became the surprise sleeper hit of 1995. Yes. And when it um, premiered in theaters, uh, it came in second only to Apollo 13. And we had talked about Apollo 13 in the past. It was a blockbuster. Yeah. Um, so for Clueless to come in second to a movie like that um, yeah. really tells you the effect it has had on audiences. I mean, just over the years, people are still watching this movie, discovering this movie, and you know, it's really um, been a lasting, um, a lasting product uh, over the yeah. years. And it's amazing for something that was so of the moment, you know, in terms of fashion and music, that it could have that kind of resonance, even with you know, younger people watching it today, high school kids and college kids watching today, yes. and they could still like connect it's that's a true testament to the quality of the film definitely and um that movie is considered one of the best high school teen movies of all time and the next movie we have on the list is from 1997 and it is about a high school reunion um a little switcheroo here and it is Romy and Michelle's high school reunion and it was starring uh, Lisa Kudrow and Mira Sorvino. Now this, um, I, we should probably talk a little bit about the, um, uh, I'm laughing. I'm laughing too. already. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing too because your dog is so cute in the background. Like Rowan, what? what's storming where I am, so. He's, he's unsettled. Um, <laughs> But we should talk a little bit about the Best Supporting Actress Oscar Curse, which is a the conventional wisdom in Hollywood that winning the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in a Motion Picture kills your career. Which I and never got. I, I'm sure there are more examples. I haven't really- Marissa Tomei. Marissa, Marissa Tomei. Tomei for um, years. <laughs> and um, yeah, and you know, there were rumors flying even at the time that that was a mistake, like that her winning it was a mistake. So mm -hmm. I don't, but let's go back to Mira Sorvino for a second um, because she was coming off her 1995 Best Supporting Actress Academy Award win for the Woody Allen film, Mighty Aphrodite. Yes. And hit a downhill slope of really strange films and some bad choices and then you know kind of fell off the grid um 
in movies in general for a while. I mean, she's reemerged lately and like she had a great role in Modern Family, but she never kind of garnered the credibility an Oscar winning actress would and a Hollywood family, you know, or Paul, her father, Paul Sorvino, incredibly well-respected actor. This film, I don't think helped her uh, gravitas as an actor. Uh, Lisa Kudrow and Mira Sorvino play, Mira Sorvino play these sort of bubble-headed women who are going back to their high school reunion and desperately want to convince the class that they have made something of themselves when in fact they have not. <laughs> and they come up with the genius idea to tell people that they invented post-it notes. Um, which, you know, almost immediately upon getting to the reunion, they run into Janine Garofalo, who's sort of a chip on her shoulder, uh, you know, abused in high school. I'll show you character uh, that, that, you know, has it out for these two beautiful, tall, you know, you know, they're brightly dressed and very, you know, showy women. And mm -hmm. Garoppolo is this mousy, intellectual, you know, kind of resentful. And so the minute they tell her that they've invented post-it notes, mm -hmm. she says, no, you didn't. And she immediately proceeds to tell them who did invent post-it notes and the story behind it, which almost everybody knows. Right. So, and then it's just the story of these, of everyone getting to know everyone in the movie as an individual and not judging them for their surface qualities, which is a great message. And I think part of the reason this film is kind of endured is that it's a great message. If you can get past the fact that Lisa Kudrow and Mira Sorvino are so over the top in the film that it's very difficult to not judge them for that <laughs> um, as an audience member. And it did well enough that I think it, spawned, it certainly spawned a prequel about their lives. And, um, you know, so it there, the film saw a lot of success and it's a funny film and there's another good soundtrack to it. Oh it's my gosh, it was a great movie. soundtrack. Um, talk about a great 80s soundtrack. Yeah. Um, this was the soundtrack to have. In fact, the soundtrack, the movie soundtrack for Romeo and Michelle was so successful that they released a second soundtrack um, with more of that good nostalgic 80s Eastside music. Side soundtrack. My goodness, I mean, we're talking Bananarama, the Go-Go's. Yeah. The Bangles, uh, I mean, it was a great Yeah, soundtrack. exactly, yeah. exactly. And so speaking of soundtracks, we had mentioned this before, but the guy really known for having great movie soundtracks in his movies and really meticulous about picking the music is John Cusack. And I only bring that up because this film, Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion, was released the same month, April of 1997, as the John Cusack film, Gross Point Blank, which of course also centers around a high school reunion mm -hmm. and also had a killer soundtrack featuring classic 80s songs. So um, it's kind and of interesting to see. Wow, is that a great movie too. Yes. I mean, John Cusack, Jeremy Piven, going back to Gross Point, Michigan for their high school reunion and John <laughs> Cusack is a, is a hit man. Right, so right. A, di a, a different take on the high school reunion uh, exactly. A better film, in my opinion, but Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion is certainly, um, while not the best uh, buddy film, certainly fits the definition in very strict terms of a female buddy. Oh, movie. yeah. And it was a, a really, really enjoyable to watch, especially yeah. if you're a woman of a certain age and that yes. was, you know, um, your, your nostalgic look back yes. into high school. It's definitely, definitely a fun watch. So the next film... This is the one film I believe, yeah, out of all the films on this list, Deb, I did not see this movie. And that is The Sweetest Thing from 2002, starring Cameron, Cameron Diaz and her friend, um, Christina Applegate. Yeah, The Sweetest Thing got bad reviews. It was not a well-reviewed movie. Now, you can say if you are, you know, your inner feminist is screaming in the background, that that's because these two women were extremely alpha in the film. Christina Applegate and Cameron Diaz are both high-powered women with high-powered jobs. They're aggressive sexually. They are not, I mean, non-committal to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, the film made people bristle a little bit. But from a pure comedy perspective, this movie is 
hilarious. The two girls meet a guy played by Thomas Jane in a bar one of their first nights out, on a night out. And there's an immediate connection between Cameron Diaz's character and Thomas Jane's character. And they know that Thomas Jane is going to a wedding in Northern California. So Christina Applegate and, and, and Cameron Diaz jump in the car and they're gonna follow. Now this is the part of the movie I love and this is what a female buddy film for me is the caper. I love a caper. I like doing them with my friends. Like, oh, like that, you know, wasn't he supposed to be dating her? Let's follow him and see where he goes. And it's that crazy <laughs> night, you know, where you just get a wild hair and you do it. And you laugh about it with your friends for years to come. And um, this was these two women following this guy to this wedding only to discover that yes, he's going to a wedding in Northern California and he is the groom. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, so, and it, obviously there is this love connection between Cameron Diaz and Thomas Jane's character, uh, Christina, Christina Applegate, who I will watch in anything. Um, She's is, great. I believe she has a great show on Netflix right now. Um, she is you know, had a great run on, uh, as a cameo on Friends as Jennifer Aniston's, Jennifer Aniston's sister. She's done a ton of supporting role stuff. Um, but she All the is, way back from Married with Children, you know? Yeah, and then yeah. she was also on Anchorman. Um, yeah, yes. she's been great. Right, Mr. Burgundy, <laughs> um, you have, a, I can't even say the line. Um, <laughs> it's the pants, it's the pleading. Um, but yeah, Christina Applegate is, you know, um, and it's so funny because she and Ed O'Neill started off and married with children, yeah. played his son, and to see how those two have stayed in the business, stayed sure. employed, succeeded and really thrived in the industry is great. It's just awesome to watch. It's a great um, story. It's yeah, a great story. The thing has some really laugh out loud moments and is definitely worth watching if you haven't seen it, for sure. All right, it is on my list. So our next movie, a little bit more recent from 2011, and I can't think of a single person who has not seen this movie. And we're talking, of course, about Bridesmaids. Yeah, I mean, I it's more of an ensemble cast, uh, but obviously there is that buddy component to it um, between Christian Wiig's character and Maya Rudolph, who's the bride-to-be. Annie and um, Lillian. And their friendship and the strain. And actually, this is a, is a great film for a number of reasons. The comedy is incredible. But the, sh the simple premise of a somewhat self-absorbed bride who is not sensitive to the cost of a wedding for a bridesmaid, which for any of us who have been a bridesmaid, you know, it's a huge financial commitment to be a bridesmaid. In I was going to say, there are a lot of moments in this film. I mean, a lot of ridiculous moments too, where you think, really, there's no yeah. way. But and, there are a lot of moments where you can relate. You're right. Um, right. And that I think is why this film connected with so many women, because yeah. there are those moments. Who doesn't you know, remember when they were asked to be a bridesmaid and maybe the dress was too limit, uh, limiting financially or there was a trip or this and that. And yeah, you remember all those, those moments. Yeah, and every bride says the same thing. I paid all that money when I was your bridesmaid. So now yes. you know, I paid all that money when I was her <laughs> bridesmaid. So suck it up because it's my way. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, these it's hard, but you know, and then the fact that Kristen Wiig is in such a dark place, emotionally, yes, financially, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and Maya, her best friend, is in such a wonderful place, and it puts this huge strain on this friendship, which again, as we've said before, is part of the reason this movie is so funny, because there's so much depth to what's going on with the storyline, and even the, the romantic relationship with Kristen Wiig and um, the you know policeman who is fantastic, and she thwarts you know 
she completely throws the relationship under the bus at every turn um, and is self-sabotaging everything in her life, we, that they still manage to milk so much comedy out of those moments. It's, I mean, everybody's seen Bridesmaids. Everyone would watch it again if it was on TV tonight or on yes, cable uh-huh. or streaming. I might go do it right after we're done. <laughs> it's hilarious. The women are hilarious. It's, you know, the great buddy film. And of course, you know, who could forget Melissa McCarthy and her star turn in this movie. I kind of liken her, her turn in this movie to uh, Jack Black in High Fidelity almost stole the show from the lead character you know yeah. in that case it was john cusack in this case kristen wig and maya rudolph because you just remember that particular character and the the scenes they stole <laughs> you gotta go back and watch that movie again she has a bunch of lot like there are all of these little moments in that film where she is just hitting it out of the park with comedy that you don't even notice you're you know paying attention to the plot and the the women with the upset stomach in the dress store. There's a scene at the very beginning of the film. It's a party and uh, mm-hmm. Melissa McCarthy first appears, you know, and she's always dressed in that <laughs> inappropriately. And she's having a conversation with someone at this party, you know, and she's the person at the party you don't want to talk to. Right, yeah, the one you and, stay away from. <laughs> I, I can't remember the exact line, but she's telling this person that she fell off a cruise ship. That's like, she's back home because she's recovering. And you're like, what? Like I had to rewind the film. <laughs> and this is probably the third or fourth time I'd seen the movie. Like, did she just say she fell, <laughs> fell off the deck of a cruise ship? And you picture those, cru- I mean, the visual is so funny and it's a line that, you know, passes you by completely. Right, you know? right. You're concentrating on all the other things going yeah. on during that party. But yeah, I mean, she was really, she was really something in this yeah. movie. And of course, um, you know, one of my favorite scenes, and I know it's yours too, was the, the airplane scene where she, uh, she and the air marshal, you know, just, uh, I that, can't even describe that, that scene. Change is, <laughs> I mean, it's priceless. Yes. And that, of course, is her real-life husband, Ben Falcone, or Ben Falcone. Those two have appeared together in at least eight films, uh, mainly her films, and he, you know, does a cameo here and there. Um, And I'm mentioning that because uh, Ben also appears in her next movie, and um, that is 2013's The Heat, also starring Melissa McCarthy and Sandra Bullock this time around. This is... um the top of my <clears throat> the top of my list for female buddy movies if it hits every note perfectly this movie is again a 10 out of 10 it's hilariously funny it's as funny as any of the guy buddy movie comedies which you know was another kind of ongoing conventional wisdom in hollywood that women aren't as funny as men right yeah this film is right right up there with the funniest guy buddy movies I've ever seen. It's the top of my list for if we were just doing buddy movies without any sort of gender Gender attached to it. Yeah. Um, Sandra Bullock plays an uptight FBI agent. Melissa McCarthy plays a- The exact opposite. (laughs) Yeah, a a, a not by the book Boston cop. investigate i mean they're investigating a crime uh sandra bullock's trying to get a promotion uh melissa mccarthy is trying to keep her family together keep her brother on the straight and narrow um and they're both trying to get bring down the bad guy and their contrary methodology what works together and uh, their friendship forms in that odd couple sort of way. And it's just a fantastic movie. Sandra, Sandra Bullock gets huge marks from me. You know Melissa McCarthy's gonna be funny. Everything that comes out of her mouth is funny. Every move she makes is funny. Sandra Bullock, you wouldn't necessarily think that. I mean, this right. is an Oscar winning actress. She's made some you know, serious films and she's also made some action films, but not a lot of comedies. And she is goes toe to toe with Melissa McCarthy, and every she really scene. stepped up to the plate in this. Absolutely, one. yeah. I mean, 
completely applaud her on in this film and I really hope they make another one. I don't know if there's anything in the works, <laughs> but I would see the heat part two in a heartbeat. Right. I mean that combination so worked. They were so yeah. complimentary to each other. And you're right, it's hard to top a Melissa McCarthy when you're talking about a comedy, but really <laughs> you're right. It's it's remarkable the yeah. teaming of these two. All right. Yeah. Speaking about laugh out loud comedy the last movie on our list uh, from 2017 is Girls Trip. And just thinking about the scenes from that movie. And, um, you know, this is Regina Hall, Queen Latifah, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Tiffany Haddish, the Flossy Posse. And it is um, important to note that, you know, we talked about this in last week's show, Deb. We talked about how the film Stir Crazy with Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder, which was directed by Sidney Poitier, um, was the first African-American directed movie to take in $100 million at the box office. So now fast forward to 2017, um, this is the first film not only directed, but produced, written, and starring an African-American cast that crossed the $100 million threshold at the box office. So it took that long um, for something like, like this to, to you know, really experience tremendous box office success. But my gosh, what a film. What a film. And I'm telling you this movie, and it blew every box office expectation for the film out of the water. I think the original predictions were that it would make between 10 and $20 million its opening weekend. It made oh my 30 goodness. million definitely count on some sort of follow-up to this because when they when Hollywood discovers an untapped market that is which would be an all African-American all female buddy yeah. comedy we'll definitely see something more along these lines which I applaud and welcome because this movie is great um, you've got this kind of standard old school talent Queen Latifah Jada Pinkett Smith and then the emergence of really the person who kind of stole the movie as the hothead character, uh, the actress Tiffany Haddish, who has exploded on the scene. Yes. She is a naturally funny person. Her humor, I mean, if you have not seen her host Saturday Night Live after the <laughs> film came out, it's something to see. I mean, she wears her Grammy dress the same she white dress. Hour. Yeah, and she <laughs> says she's not going to buy a dress. I'm with her. her once. My and, gosh, that dress fits her like a glove. It's and beautiful. every woman in America and in the in the audience is cheering her on. Exactly. Saying, Thank you, because all of us who've never been to those awards shows are like, what are they doing, spending all that money on a dress? Yeah. And then getting rid of it afterwards. <laughs> and here she is she's wearing, wearing it, it every time. Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and she's uh, just hysterical. And the film, again, is a road trip buddy story with a lot of underlying depth, a lot of complexity. Um, the women have a lot going on in their lives. There's conflict that's all, uh, you know, wrapped in this great comic element. I mean, Queen Latifah, there's no one better. Um, she, when it comes to delivering uh, funny lines with depth, she is incredible to watch, so talented. Jada Pinkett Smith, obviously talented. Regina Hall, I mean, these women together work so well. It, you know, it, I picture the, you know, four cogs, you know, in a, right. in a female yeah. turning together. Um, they share the screen well. They complement each other. It's very well written and very funny and is, you know, well worth seeing if you haven't seen it yet. Well, you're right about Queen Latifah, though. I mean, she has been one of my favorites. And that woman can do it all. When she's funny, she is hilarious. When she's serious, I mean, you're kind of scared because she's really serious and so believable. Um, but she is great in this movie. And you're right. I mean, those four women just complement each other so well. Yeah. And it works really well in this yeah. movie. So you'd be happy to know that there's actually a treatment for the, the sequel that exists. And so, you know, and some of the original cast members had individually confirmed that there have been talks uh, about this sequel. So it may be sooner rather than later. We'll see. Yeah, that's good to know. And, um, you know, it's also, I hope it kind of 
spawns uh, this, you know, kind of subgenre, so that you know, rather than just creating sequels, which tend to not be as good as the original, right? Um, you know, because they have a built-in audience, so they don't really have to work that hard to make the screenplay as tight as they could, and it's just to invest in films in African American female buddy films and see if they can come up with another story with a great cast and a great story that's compelling the way Girls Trip is. It'd be, you know, a welcome change in Hollywood. Oh, most definitely. And we're looking forward to that, um, you know, and if there is a sequel, I am going to be one of the first to see that yeah, because I know. really enjoyed this film. So like Girls Trip, you know, half of these movies we've featured, um, even last week's show about male buddy movies, they sit around a group of friends reconnecting and something that's sorely needed these days when we really can't do it physically. Um, it's challenging for us to reconnect in person, but you know, there are other ways we can do so. You and I Zoom every week, which is kind of a great way of connecting yeah. and, uh, and, and talking. Or I would actually recommend that you and your best bud virtually watch, you know, some of these movies together um, yeah. as a way of connecting. And, you know, if you saw Beaches when you were in high school, maybe see it again, you know, when you're in your, what, 40s or 50s and, and, and see what that experience is like. You're now yeah. older and wiser. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more insight is going to come into those discussions. Well, I mean, if you bawled your eyes out watching Beaches when you were 20, <laughs> I can only imagine what it's going to do to you when you're 50. I mean, yes. holy cow, that movie is really... <laughs> If you thought, you know, you connected with it then, I mean, yeah. think about it now with, with all these experiences along the way. So in parting, we are going to make a classic thirst quencher, Deb, perfect for the seemingly never, endi uh, never ending heat wave we're in <laughs> right now. Um, and that is peach iced tea. We are taking advantage of the peach harvest um, in many parts of the country. The peaches are incredible right now. I mean, I've, you know, it's always, for me, fruit's always, you know, as Jerry Seinfeld says, fruit's a gamble. <laughs> but I always, um, you know, it's hit or miss. Yes. But lately, the peaches have been just fantastic. Every bite. Yes, every bite. They're all over the place. I mean, just the name peach iced tea makes me smile. Um, and also, we're doing this as an homage to... Um, the Rockford Peaches women's baseball uh, okay. team as featured in A League of Our Own. So that is also um, one way to look at this. So this concoction incorporates fresh peaches with, uh, you know, standard freshly brewed iced tea. And voila, you have something that, you know, is, is very satisfying, reminds you of summer, brings a smile to your face. That sounds so, great. And it's amazing how the, the difference of real, like using real peaches and real peach juice changes that. You know, people are used to, you say peach iced tea, people are kind of like, mm, you think of that like artificial flavoring, but when- No, no. Peaches, yeah, it's, it's, it's really it's easy to make. Yeah, yeah, with peach simple syrup and, and iced tea that you brew at home. Yeah, definitely. So we will have this very easy, simple recipe for you on gazellemagazine.com. So Deb, it's been another great show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Trish. Thanks for having me. And be sure to be among the first to view new episodes of The Stir. And you can do that by subscribing to our YouTube channel. And thank you once again, and we will see you next time on The Stir. Thank you.